coming to you from the Star City. This is Scarlet Fever, a daily Nebraskan production. Let's go. Scarlet Fever's back. It's a Wednesday. It's the middle of the week. We're halfway through the work week. And life is good. Life is doing great. life is doing really great. Danny Berg's here. Ben Beacon. Ben Beacham's here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I I missed it. I missed it almost. It was very close. Got it right last show. I got it. I it took me a second to get it right last show, but I knew I'd screwed up again because I'd been calling him by the wrong name for so long. And I oh, did it again, and now I am sad. <laughs> this is not fun. This is uh, September twenty fifth. Is our record date. This is. Episode 10. We, we've we reached the double digits. Man. It happened already. It happened fast. Yeah, been on the grind. We, we really have been grinding. This has been a lot of fun so far, but now we have episodes on both hands. Two big hands. And we're going to have some fun today, so let's let's jump right in. We didn't have Ben on the show, uh, either show on Monday, so he didn't really get to give his football thoughts. So to open the show today, I wanted to let Ben give some of his big football takeaways and some of the things that really stood out to him uh, from the Illinois football game last Friday. So, Ben, I'll let you uh, take it away. I think Matt Rule got out-adjusted by Brett Bielma at halftime. Going into the half, up 17-10. It looked like things were going well. It looked like they were going to win. Illinois comes out. They do everything right that they were doing wrong in the first half. They controlled the ball for longer. They converted on their third downs. They Brett Bioma did what he needed to do to win the football game. Uh, the RPO action, especially in the second half, absolutely decimated Nebraska's defense. It seemed like if they handed it off, they would get five, six yards every play. Every pass, Luke Altmaier, who looked amazing, looked like one of the best quarterbacks in the conference last weekend uh he was firing on all cylinders finding all of his receivers short did not look down the field much but jail it didn't really matter he went 21 of 27 215 yards four touchdowns did not turn over the ball he has not thrown an interception this season 10 touchdowns zero interceptions that's pretty impressive he has taken a huge step up last season i think he threw 13 touchdowns 10 interceptions yeah i remember last year i was at the illinois game when Nebraska went down to Champaign, I remember watching Luke Altmaier, and it was just, it, di it didn't look like it was a Big Ten quarterback. It, it looked like your prodigal Big Ten West offense that struggled to throw the ball, that had to run a lot, and sometimes the defense was there, sometimes the defense wasn't. Now that was an absolutely sloppy game. It was messy. It was, I think it was 20 to 9 was the final score, and... I don't think the scoreboard told you the whole picture of that game because it just was so messy and it, it looked like a Pee Wee football game. Yeah. It really did. But but this time around, it, it didn't. It it did look like it was a top twenty five game. And I will be the poster child for this. I feel like I completely overlooked Illinois. And I think a lot of people overlooked Illinois. I overlooked Illinois and Altmaier specifically. I think last time I was on the show, I said the X factor of the game was Luke Altmaier and if he can outplay Dylan Rayola and fire on all cylinders. And I guess I was right. He did do that, and they did win because of him. Would but. you would you say, though, that he outplayed Rayola? Because Rayola did have himself a pretty solid game, too. I mean, he... he went 24 for 35, three touchdowns, and arguably should have been four. With the with the Nayer interception, I think that almost was an interception. three. Yeah, I think it was an interception. But but still, he he had four. Let's call it catches in the end zone. Three touchdowns, <laughs> one interception. Put it like that. And nearly three hundred yards. He finished with two hundred and ninety seven yards. Would you argue that Altmaier outplayed Rayola? I would say Altmaier outplayed him because he didn't make those freshman mistakes that Rayola did, especially in overtime. Rayola was just too indecisive. Took a long time that intentional grounding call or play, that was bad. That was you could see his freshman coming through on that one. Altmaier just he knows what he can do. He knows that he's not that guy who's pushing it down the field. He's just I think he knows his limits and he played within them as well as he did. We got to remember too, and the expectations are through the roof for this team. 
We also got to remember that Dylan Rayola is 18 years old. Yeah. Maybe 17, 18, 19, somewhere in that range. Came in early after his senior year of college of, of high school football and basically just ran through the cornfields without any kind of n- knocking him down or any rain falling on him. Like, he was a dominant quarterback in high school. And that's the reason why he was the number one quarterback prospect in his class. Like, that just doesn't happen for no reason. And like you mentioned with the freshman coming out, this was really the first pressure pack situation that he's been in in his collegiate career. And I don't think he handled it very well. No, I don't think he did either. The first three games, they really didn't call on him to throw the ball a ton. Maybe in the Northern Iowa game, they looked towards the pass a little bit more. But that wasn't a high-pressure situation. Against Colorado, he wasn't expected to really sling it as much as he did against Illinois. And, but he, and he couldn't against, against Colorado either just because of how much the receivers were tied up. Yeah, and then first high-pressure situation... It's it's kind of it's a little disappointing to see Rayola have kind of this kind of have his resume tainted a little bit in the first game. But the outlook is good the rest of the year. I think getting those mistakes out early, especially in a ranked matchup, is good. You wouldn't want it to be a close game with Wisconsin or Iowa late in the season. Those mistakes finally come out. I think kind of Learning from this is the most important thing for him. And the sky is not falling either. Like, this is not the end-all, be-all for Dylan Rayola. And for this to happen in the first Big Ten game, is probably better for it to happen than on the road at USC when you maybe have seven or eight wins and you're maybe have an outside shot at making the 12-team playoff if you wanted to – look in that realm very outside shot it's a very outside shot but i mean going into last week a lot of people were thinking hey nebraska goes four and oh they who knows maybe something will happen i think that's incredibly unrealistic now considering what we've seen and more so from another facet of the game which we'll get into but sticking with the offense i wanted to get your opinions on this uh ben Droz brought this up on monday Dante Dowdell had 20 carries on Friday for just 72 yards. And this got into the discussion of why is Dante Dowdell being treated like RB1 when he hasn't been playing like it? I think they just, I don't know if they can trust in Gabe Irvin, if they can trust in Emmett Johnson as much. They stepped up last year a little bit, but there was really no competition there. Dante Dowdell, he has he showed explosiveness, but he's not a 20-carry guy, especially when you have that uh, backfield depth. The first, three, the first two or three games, you saw everybody. It's a little odd that you see uh, Rule roll out him 20 times, especially post-game press conference, or this week, I can't remember which, he said he wanted to give him 25 carries. It's just odd, especially when the game script was not favoring the run. No. If you take away Dowdell's longest run of the game, which was 14 yards, that knocks him down to 19 attempts on 55 yards rushing. That's an average of just a little under three yards carry. Now, I know that doesn't tell the whole story because he did rip off a couple of longer runs, but he's not picking up the yards that you need out of your ground game. And then you flip it over to Ramir Johnson, who was supposed to be RB1A and RB1B with Dowdell, and he only gets four carries on the game. It's odd, especially because Ramir Johnson's looked explosive in his limited touches this year. I Especially late in the game when they were going more towards the pass, I would have liked to see Ramir Johnson in there more. I also think it's important to note that uh, the offensive line, a little banged up, Turner Corcoran goes down, Gunnar Gertula fills in, and Michael Miskua still out for coach's decision. Henry Lutovsky's filling in. I would have liked to see Mizkua come in, especially in a ranked matchup. But the interior line and the the left side of the line especially banged up. Dowdell, he likes to run between the tackles, but he likes to also bounce outside. 
and neither were really working. He's not that prolific of a pass catcher. So I would have liked to see Ramirez Johnson in there more in the pass game. I Especially against Purdue this week, one of the worst rushing defenses in the country. I'd like to see him switch up a little bit and get some fresh legs out there. So another question I wanted to pose, and this is just something that I've seen in recent days, with the Micah Mazuka situation, do you think that rule keeping him off of the field is a culture thing and something I think, he's trying think, to develop? I think it is. I think it has to be like whatever he did can't fly, but it's also – I think it's a good thing he isn't giving up on him and kicking him off the team immediately. I think it kind of sets the culture where even a guy, a transfer who came in from Florida, a starter, even he can't do it and still be on the field. Whatever he did, uh, I think it's, I think that's a culture thing. I, I don't know how, I, especially because we don't know what he did, I can't really have final thoughts on the decision, but I think it is a culture thing for Rule. Yeah, I'm with you too, and I, and I think that for for Rule that's trying to rebuild this program, he's done a good job of it so far, is you want to have those expectations set with the guys because as we've seen, and a big one I look to is Nebraska basketball last year that had a probably more off-the-court issues than they probably wanted to, and I thought Fred Hoiberg handled it very well, but... That's something that Rule has to develop because he hasn't been here all that long and there were things that players were getting away with before he got here. So the fact that he's prioritizing character over playing time I think really is a testament to Rule's coaching ability. I think that's, what keep, that's what's keeping players here. In the offseason, didn't see many players transfer out. I think the culture that he's building here and the culture that he's already built is important to keeping player retention, player development. I think leaving Mazkua off the field is important to inst- keeping that culture instilled. Agreed. Um, let's transition to the wide receiver room, the receiving rooms. Nair and Banks, both with some pretty solid days, two touchdowns for Isaiah Nair. Banks had eight catches for 94 yards. We really got to see the – the fruits of the labors of the recruiting that brought both of these guys here. Corey Barney also had a really nice game as well in some short yarded situations. But especially for Banks and Nair, they really haven't had like they really both haven't had good games at the same time yet. Yeah. And they both both of them had over ninety yards individually. So that was nice to see the ball distribution from from Dylan Rayola as he had eight different receivers on the day. Yeah, I think it's nice to see Banks and Nair both get going in the same game. They both played well against UTEP. Both had touchdowns, I believe. But it's nice to see them get targeted a lot more often. It was very obvious early in the game that Banks was Rayle's go-to guy. I think he had three catches on one drive. Yep. And that that is important. Earlier in the first three games, it didn't seem like he had a go-to guy. He was really spreading the ball around, which is good. It's good to have that receiving depth. But it's also great to have guys like Banks in there that's just like you need a first down. You go to him. On that third and 11 on Nebraska's first scoring drive, nice throw to Banks on that. Back shoulder catch to Banks on the two-minute uh, drill. He He's just his guy. He's his go guy. Nair with the miraculous catch uh, at the end of the half. I didn't even think it was intended for him. It looked like he kind of just swooped in and got it. And it's nice to see those two. Also, I've been a huge fan of Ja'Cory Barney. I think Matt Rule says he has one speed fast. And they, they love to give him the ball. It's, it's great to see a freshman, especially when they have a guy like Lloyd already on the team, see a freshman step up and kind of take that role over. One last thing on the offense. How, after four games, how do you feel about the way that Marcus Satterfield has been deploying Thomas Fedoni? I think it's been a little questionable. I think when you have kind of that safety valve that he was he kind of served as last year, you see him going down the field a lot more. He had two catches, but for 46 yards, average 23 yards per catch. I think it's weird that he's kind of getting him down the field a lot more. I would expect guys like Barney, Nayer, Banks to get down the field. But I do. he has had some success so far. 
I would like to see him more in the short yardage situation, though, and have guys like Carter Nelson go deep. Agreed. So let's transition to the defense because that was a major topic of discussion on Monday's show about how, for the most part, it was just not what they were looking for, um, especially with how easily that Illinois was able to move the ball down the field. And some concerns were starting to get raised after the UNI game. When you have concerns coming up after only giving up three points on defense to an FCS team, there's something brewing. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to continue, but that means that something's amiss. And we saw that continue last week. A lot of the same problems and what it was primarily attributed to was the tackling. And it clearly looked like it was not in the right place on Friday. Yeah, it kind of seems like a broken record. I feel like we've been talking about Nebraska's tackling for years and years, even before Matt Rule got here. I, the linebackers, they need to get better open field tackling. Other than John Bullock, none of the linebackers really had that big of a game, more of the X factors. Other than tackling, I think the biggest thing they need to do better is getting pressure. They looked great against Colorado, but that's Colorado's offensive line. Which has not played very well. This Illinois offensive line gave up three sacks the week before to Central Michigan, a team from the MAC. A group of five teams. Back shed. And then you go against the Nebraska defensive line. Coming this year was touted by Nebraska fans as one of the best in the country. Not just Nebraska fans, nationally. Yeah, nationally. I think Nebraska fans were giving them more love, but a lot of people <laughs> give them love. But to, you have a guy like Tony White at the helm. Nebraska fans are worried about him getting a head coaching job in the offseason. After one year. After one year. And then you see them go out there, get two sacks. And it's a weak Illinois offensive line. Not promising. They didn't get much pressure against Northern Iowa. That was one of my big takeaways from the game. They could not generate a ton of pressure, getting, allowing Northern Iowa to get those short yardage plays off that kind of broke off. And I think kind of the tackling the lack of pressure kind of coincide. Altmaier had a lot of time to throw, get those short wraps developing, and then when you have the dynamic receivers in the open field, it's hard for them to get those tackles. It was, it was a little amazing to see just how much time that Altmaier had. I equated it to having, like, literally time to go make your breakfast, brush your teeth, comb your hair, and go to the bathroom. Like, he literally could probably have done all those things and then thrown the football and made a 20-yard completion. Because, yes, he was getting flushed out of the pocket at a somewhat decent clip, trying to break the offensive lineman and being able to get to the quarterback was just something they weren't doing. And sometimes, and I didn't really think about this two days ago, but I had some time to to ponder on it. It's one of the downsides of having the 3-3-5 in the formation yeah. that Tony White has. Now, they're, again, small sample size because it worked last year. So I'm not exactly saying that Tony White needs to get away from it yet. But when you have a 3-3-5 like that, and you're you and you're trying to rush four, that only leaves two linebackers behind. Or if you bring someone down from the secondary to 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 try and pressure. But Nebraska doesn't blitz. No. We mentioned how it, after the first week how they didn't blitz against UTEP. Our rationale to them not blitzing was they didn't want to give Colorado tape. And they also didn't need to blitz in that game because UTEP's offensive line just did not play well. A lot of quick passes from UTEP also. Right. They didn't really blitz against Colorado, if at all. I don't really remember them blitzing against Colorado. I think they maybe had like a 13% blitz percentage. If, if that, they didn't really blitz against Northern Iowa. Again, didn't really have to, and the ball was also coming out really, really fast. Then Friday comes, they're not blitzing, and Luke Altmaier usually has all day to throw. So that begs the question, when are we going to start seeing blitzing? And, and, and I hope it, it comes soon because I think we need to at least see it as part of some defensive packages. Yeah, I think teams are starting to recognize that if you want to succeed against Nebraska's defense, you're just going to have to get the ball out quick. If you get the ball out quick... Uh, putting the game up to Nebraska's linebackers and secondary and their tackling, 
Nebraska's not going to win many of those games if that's what they're betting their defense on. It's odd that they have such talented pass rushers, but they're just not using them. And I think it's a little it's a little too far gone to say, oh, Tony White just doesn't want to give up the tape. It's your Big Ten opener against a ranked team. You pull out all the stops, no matter who it is. Another thing, too, that I didn't really think about was when we're when we're talking about the pressure that was getting on to Luke Altmeyer, he really also wasn't throwing the ball deep. No, his longest completion was twenty nine yards but, on a touchdown to Pat. Brown. But that was also on a short pass. Yeah, it was it was on. I if I'm not mistaken, I think it was was it on a screen pass or was it on just a short I, pass in front of the line of scrimmage? I think it was a deeper pass, but Pat Bryant was absolutely wide open. No one was there, so not a difficult okay. pass. So so not a difficult pass, but a lot of times when you're getting when Illinois was getting these big chunk plays, it was. Short passes when you have open space between the line of gain and the line of scrimmage. Everyone from the secondary is back already. You have only two linebackers home because all your defensive linemen and A linebacker are up rushing. So they're able to rip off 10, 15 yards, which they were able to do six times. And five of those six passes, according to their drive sheet, which I'm looking at right now, were short passes. Just the touchdown pass to Pat Bryan in the second in the first quarter was a deep ball that Altmaier threw, and that was really a wide open pass. Yeah, uh, it would. You knew I mean, that, that was a touchdown. Win the oh ball. Oh my goodness! As as soon as Bryan got open, you knew it was a touchdown. Yeah, and that was really demoralizing, especially because it was right at the start of the game. It was like three minutes in. Yeah, it seemed like it was going to be a really long night after that. It was a long night, but not not terrible overall. No, it, it wasn't, but I'm just I feel more concerned about this defense than I feel like we should, considering how many players they brought back. Yeah. And their reputation that they have, Tony White's reputation, the leaders on this team. It's it's a little strange to see the regression because we know the talent level that this team has. And I don't know how much they can do on Saturday against Purdue to make me feel better about them yet. Yeah, you can't really do much against Purdue to make this team feel better, especially because it's Purdue. They're maybe the worst team in the conference. Then you look ahead on their schedule, though. Yeah, Rutgers, and I believe Indiana is the game after that. Yep. Rutgers, a team with a very good running back, one-two punch, Kyle Manon guy, Sammy Brown the fifth. Both very good running backs, veteran running backs. Kyle Manon, guys, among one of the best in the country. They're just going to run it down. They're going to punch Nebraska in the throat. They're going to attempt to do it at least. We're going to see how this run defense is, it gets, pra- gets, gets coached up and how they do in practice. Because, excuse me, while, while the run defense was one of the stronger points for this team, it did not look strong at all last week. Right? They – they were able to rip off a lot of big runs. They they had four four rushes of ten plus against Nebraska. They had two for twenty one yards. So something is going to have to give because you at least need to be good at one thing on defense, whether it's the rush or the pass. And right now they're struggling in both. They're they already have issues in the secondary. The secondary is not all that strong. So when you take Tom Hill out of the equation. Right. And so they're the the, the rush de- the rush defense, which is one of the key components of this team, has to get better. It it, it just does because the front four is really your make or break. If you can rush fast enough you can force the quarterback to speed up his process and make an errant throw or a throw that he doesn't want to make but when you're not giving when when you're not quickly moving to get there get to to get to the passer he's just going to bail out and he's going to find wide open space and just deliver a bomb down the field yeah it's also demoralizing when you have 
probably the two faces of this defense, Nash Hutmacher and Ty Robinson, are in the middle of that front four. It's a little demoralizing when the leaders on your defense are leading the unit that has just been lackluster this year. Yeah, it, it is a little discouraging to see that, and there, you could tell they're a little discouraged too. Let's do a little, uh, what are we expecting to see this weekend, Ben? I hope they go out and dominate <laughs> Purdue. Purdue has been, to sugarcoat it, they've been terrible. They've been horrendous. They open up the season 49 nothing against Indiana State. You think maybe there's some promise here. Hudson Card looked really good. They get a week off, weird week two by week. And then they go host Notre Dame, 66 to 7 loss. I was happy about that. It seemed like Notre Dame made them look like an FCS team. Notre Dame coming off a loss to a Mac school at home. I was not happy about that. And Hudson Card has looked abysmal. Maybe like the worst quarterback in the conference. 11 of 24, 124 yards, touchdown, and two interceptions against. Uh, Notre Dame. They also averaged 1.5 yards per carry against the Fighting Irish. Then they travel to Oregon State. Seems like maybe there's a little bit of hope. And Hudson Card plays even worse. 7 for 17, 56 yards, a touchdown interception. It's quite amazing to see just how much he's fallen since he was at Texas. Yeah. Because I still remember when he came into the game when Texas was playing Alabama and Quinn Ewers got hurt for the first time and Hudson Card had to go in. To replace them, and Texas almost pulled off the upset, but it was unranked Texas playing Alabama, number one Alabama. I mean, just how far he has collapsed. It's, and, it's not been pretty to watch. No, it hasn't. There's um, a silver lining for Purdue, though. That is Devin Mockaby. He had 16 carries, 168 yards, and a touchdown against Oregon State. If they can get him going, if the Boilermakers can get, can get him going, it could spell a little bit of trouble. They re- I think you really have to put this game on Hudson Card. That's that's how you're going to win, is force him to beat you. If Hudson Card is the X factor in the game, I really like Nebraska's chances. But it's just, there's not a lot you can say, especially with how bad the performance was from the Nebraska defense this week. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about the offense. I think the offense will be fine. I think that there will be some growing pains at the start of the game. First road game, first... Real environment test for Dylan Royola. First the new morning game. First, yeah, for for them it'll be a noon kickoff, but body clock will still say 11 a.m. So there there's going to be a lot working against them. I think that with the way that they have been coached, at least on offense and the the again culture, the way that rule is instilled in them, I think that that they will be okay. I think they'll have a slow start, but I think that they will figure it out. They'll, Contrary to what they've done, I think they will have a better second half than a first half, yeah. which is saying a lot because they have had really good first halves and not good second halves. Um, but where it's going to be interesting to watch is the Purdue offense versus the Nebraska defense, which if you said that that was going to be the matchup to watch going into this week before the season started, I would have thought you were crazy because – of the reputation that this defense had, and for the they looked good, pretty pretty solid the first two games, and it just has not been the same since. If you would have told me uh, before last week that I was having a little bit of skepticism about Nebraska against Purdue, I would have thought you were crazy. Because before Illinois, I th- after Illinois, I'm looking ahead to Rutgers. I'm looking ahead to Indiana and how good they are. But now, after that performance against Illinois. No game is a gimme anymore, especially in Big Ten Conference. Play. Not now. Not Purdue now. has played spoiler maker before, and even though it's probably their worst roster they've had in years, you just can't go into a Big Ten game and expect you're going to roll any opponent. No, not not with with the brand they've been playing. And maybe we're over exaggerating just a little bit. I think that collectively the team will be fine, but it's not going to be a pretty win. This no. is not going to be a UTEP game. Under any means. I'm hoping Nebraska can prove me wrong. but I do too. I hope they can just kind of go out there, take an early lead. Especially because Purdue has a, a abysmal run defense. I think it's bottom five in the country. 131st, if I'm not mistaken. Especially in the Big Ten, that's bad. That's bad. When a lot of teams are just going to try and run and control the clock, you can't allow that. 
like I said earlier, Nebraska needs to have fresh running backs in the game all time. Just like one, one, two carries, get him out, bring in a new guy. Dante Dowdell should not have 20 carries unless he is just playing insanely well. All right, let's make a quick pivot because there's something else I wanted to get to real quick that came out yesterday. There was a volleyball match on ABC over the weekend, Nebraska-Louisville, which Nebraska swept Louisville three sets to none. Great game. It was a pretty good game. Um, but the ratings from the game came out, The the how many people were watching and some of the PR stats, and we want I wanted to share these. So the match on Sunday averaged – 684,000 viewers on ABC going against the NFL. The first game that Nebraska played against Wisconsin last year, so the 1v2 matchup at Devaney, that was 612,000 on a Saturday night at Big Ten Network. It is the most watched regular season volleyball match on ES any of the ESPN networks, and it peaked at 808,000 people. 49% of the viewing audience was women. Pretty incredible stuff. Yeah, especially because Nebraska has touted themselves as the marquee brand in college volleyball. I think they're kind of solidifying themselves, especially when you're in some of the biggest games. Every single game, it seems like, is breaking records, especially as they keep moving on to bigger and bigger networks. And then especially throwing them up against the NFL, NFL Sunday started around the same time, I think, Volleyball might have started about an hour before. About a half an hour. But they just have so much confidence in volleyball, especially to grow as a brand. And I think Nebraska has kind of placed themselves as the conductor of that train. Yeah, it's it's also the second most regular season volleyball telecast on any network ever, which is pretty dang insane. Um, and it, it shows that the brand that has become Nebraska Volleyball and it really kicked off last year. Um, there was uh, a clip that Nebraska Volleyball put out on their social media accounts of a new signage that got put up on the Devaney Center outside the north entrance, giving some dedication to Volleyball Day last year. And I know we sound like a broken record when we say it because it is such a talking point, but it really was a momentum shifter for women's sports. Yeah, it seems like after Volleyball Day, after I left and just kind of scrolling through Instagram and Twitter, every, everyone was posting about this. This wasn't just like within the Nebraska bubble. This was everyone was talking about. That was probably the topic of the, uh, the sporting topic of the day. And not just the day. Like it, it lasted for, for a little while in the mainstream media. Obviously, we're still talking about it a year later. But you know it's a big deal when Stephen A. Smith is talking about it on first take the next day. Yeah, Stephen A. Smith, who usually keeps himself within the NBA, NFL bubble, doesn't even really talk about baseball. It's talking about college and volleyball. And, Ka and Caitlin Clark. Yeah, and Caitlin Clark. Everyone <laughs> talks about her, though. When you have a guy like the guys who kind of stay within their bubble talking about college volleyball and Nebraska volleyball, that means something. It's, it's still a little like overwhelming to try and process all of it just how much it has changed and granted coming from me it's not much because literally the first time I walked into Memorial Stadium was for volleyball day so not being from here I obviously don't have the same experience as some other people do but even I know coming coming to Nebraska from big city Chicago it was never the same as it is now. It was never like that. You turned on ESPN, even ESPN2, and there was no women's sports on. It was like American Cornhole Championships. Yeah. Like we weren't we there was no exposure like there is. And a lot of that also has to do with the Caitlin Clark revolution. We don't talk about it enough here in Nebraska because Iowa, obviously. Obviously. But it still is worth talking about because of the explosion that Caitlin Clark is. I mean, the playoff game that she had also against the NFL when they played on Sunday, the Fever in the Sun, averaged 
1.84 million people are watching that. Up against the NFL. Just the revolution that's become of women's sports is incredible. And this just personifies it with just how, how crazy this is. Yeah, as much as Nebraska people hate to admit, I do think Caitlin Clark did kind of kick the door down of a lot of people who were kind of like turned off from women's sports kind of just didn't really view it. Like most people, a lot of people didn't even view it as sports. I think Caitlin Clark kind of opened that door. It's like they can be just as good as the men. And I think Caitlin Clark set the precedent and Nebraska Volleyball saw that. They obviously big brand the state, but taking it to that national level was more accessible at that point. It's so cool to see it. And I think that especially after the Final Four last year and just how many people packed into Amelie Arena in Tampa to watch those three matches, absolutely incredible. Milwaukee, Wisconsin is now trying to get themselves a Final Four. Kelly Sheffield, the Wisconsin Badgers head coach, is lobbying to try and get something there. I mean, who's to say that this brand can't expand everywhere because it really feels like it, this is one of the fastest growing sports in terms of popularity right now. Yeah, and I see people all the time on social media, people who aren't from the state, they are fans of Nebraska volleyball, and they're coming to Nebraska because they want to be a part of a school, a university that has programs like that, a women's sporting program that is at the forefront of the university. Pretty fun things going on, but there is one thing I did want to bring up. We were talking about this before. Usually we don't talk about non-Nebraska things, but I think this is something that's worth discussing, at least for a little bit. Coming out of Las Vegas, Nebraska, or Nebraska, Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, starting quarterback Matthew Saluka has decided he's going to forego the rest of the season, play the first three games, and has decided he's going to redshirt the rest of the year for a resurgent UNLV football team because he had a verbal offer of $100,000 in NIL promises, but he only received 3000 So he is deciding to sit out the rest of the season and presumably will probably transfer out of UNLV at the end of the year. But I know we had talked about this a little bit before coming on today, but I was just curious what your initial impressions were of this. I mean, you got to pay up. If you're UNLV, you promised him 100 k to come from Holy Cross. You got to pay up. As much as I hate to say it, in this new era of college football, if you're promising, especially your quarterback, 100 k it's you kind of got to pay him. I think it's a little – I think it was a lot of mismanagement from UNLV's collective that they didn't have something written up on this. I don't – I think a lot of people are overreacting. I think a lot of people are seeing it as like a crossing of the Rubicon for college football that players are going to do this more. I think this is more UNLV's collective just completely mismanaging his money. But it, it, is, it is the first that this has ever happened, so it is kind of a shock, especially – for a UNLV team that was kind of shooting for that group of five spot in the college football playoff. And they they looked like they could do it too. Yeah, beat like, Kansas, beat Houston. They looked really, really solid to start the season. So, so a couple more things here that I'll just read out. This is from Pete Thamel. Um, quote, once Sluka enrolled at UNLV, there was no effort by uh, UNLV's collective to formalize a contract at that $100,000 amount, months after uh, Sluka enrolled and his agent, Marcus Cromarty, made multiple efforts with the staff and school to address the issue, and then the collective and the school came back with a contract of $3,000 per month for the next four months, which is 88000 less than what UNLV verbally promised up front. The only money that Matthew Sluka ever received was a $3,000 relocation stipend for moving to Las Vegas. I mean, it's, like you said, it feels like it's a lot of mismanagement on the Rebels' part because this could very easily have been avoided. I mean, yeah, you said you would promise $100,000, but if that's what you're saying, you got to do it. Yeah, You can't just throw a 
throws some cash at a at a guy who's uprooting his life from Holy Cross, nonetheless, one of the better educational institutions in the country, not so much known for their athletics, but more academics, realizing that he has a chance to go do something great at a group of five school, one of the better division ones, or one of the better mid-major schools, if you want to call them that, maybe in between mid-major and power four. We'll just leave it at that. But one of the one of the better group of five programs athletically and even academically, they're not too bad either. And then you're going to say, oh, here's just some money to help you with your move. Right. I think this kind of will set a precedent of teams need to have this stuff in writing, especially when you're getting a guy, a guy like Matthew Sluka is one of the best quarterbacks in the FCS. When you're getting a guy like that, you need to have that in writing. And I think a lot of these big NIL collectives, they, they have this stuff. In contracts, I think a lot of these schools will realize they have to follow suit. They can't they can't operate at the same level with the same amount of money as these big collectors, but they have to operate internally the same. And it's a dangerous precedent that's getting set as well because I have a feeling this is not the first time this has happened. It's probably the first time it's gone public in this fashion. I'm sure that there are guys where this has happened to and they're just like, Okay, I'm just going to suck it up and then leave the next year. Especially because Luca does not have another year of eligibility. I think that might have been the defining factor. Probably. Um, and this was probably his best chance to do something with football. If he, some miracle, found his way to the next level, to the NFL. I don't really follow UNLV, so I don't know if Sluka would even be considered to to move up or something like that. Not much of a thrower from what I've seen. He's more of a running kind of guy. But it it it's a it's a dangerous starting point because now like you said this is going to have to be something that's communicated more thoroughly. Without a doubt in my mind this was hap- this had to have been happening beforehand with schools not coming through on their promises. And even before, like, NIL was not such a taboo topic, and now that it's more widely discussed, this this seems like it's going to have some kind of ripple effect. And maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but I feel like that maybe in the coming days we will be seeing more people with situations like this. Yeah, I think that could entirely be possible. I think another thing that this could lead to is more teams being more transparent with the public and the media about how much players are getting in NIL. I think a lot of it has been just kind of like guesses and reporting about how much players are actually getting in NIL valuation. I think this could pave a path to players announcing how much they're getting paid when they get to a school, when they transfer, or how much they're getting paid while they're at the school. I think, or this could lead to more schools kind of advertising themselves you could get paid $100,000, $150,000 to be here. I think it could lead to a lot more transparency between the public and the universities and NIL overall. It's uh, it's quite the thing that's going on, and especially with all of the court cases that are going on in federal court. It, I mean, it, it's a lot to try and keep tabs on just because of how deep this rabbit hole can go. But it feels like... The NCAA and organized college athletes. Like, let me put this this way. And I, Caleb Henry told me this a couple days ago. College athletics are not going anywhere. Yeah. Like, there will always be college athletics. The way that it is shaped and formed is going to change, especially at the Division I level, more so than D2, D3. NAIA, junior college, you name it. Division one is going to be where the most turnover happens. But with everything else that's going on, it, it, it really feels like there is a hanging in the balance of the NCAA and power conferences and organizations as we know it right now, depending on how some of these cases go. And that's what makes this story so much worth watching. But there is so much behind it because NIL wasn't allowed before 
what was it, three, four years ago, something like yeah, that? about that. Obviously, all those deals were getting done under the table. There's no doubt that people were paying players before that. It just obviously wasn't made public. A lot sketchier. It, right. Jim I mean, Pruitt, McDonald's bags at Tennessee kind of stuff. <laughs> Jim Harbaugh getting in trouble for buying someone a cheeseburger. Like, yeah, or Chase Young getting suspended because someone paid him to help him move. Or James Wiseman getting suspended. For the same reason, like silly things like like silly things like that shouldn't be happening in the first place. But it really feels like there is going to be a changing of the tide with some with how some of these federal cases go down. Yeah, especially it just seems like it's evolved so many ways. I think last college basketball season, before the year, team players can even transfer twice and be eligible. Then halfway through the year, this wave of players become eligible because of the court case, and I think it was West Virginia allowing about half the team to come back because they were at their second school or second transfer. It just seems like as it keeps going, the NCAA keeps losing power in these court cases, and eventually it's just going to become obsolete. And what really is a dangerous precedent to say, you want to talk about dangerous precedents, Dartmouth's men's basketball team won a ruling last year for the men's basketball players to be considered employees of the school. I mean, I mean they're that, making money for the school. You're making – but – it's, I, I'm all for amateur sports and college athle- athletics being considered amateur sports because it, it is. Adding them to your employee list is just, I don't know. I don't feel good about that at all. I don't think it doesn't seem like a lot of teams are kind of taking, uh, taking action with Dartmouth, but uh, maybe it was because more of the Ivy League is a very weird athletic conference. That that is true. I don't know if a lot of teams will follow suit and unionize like Dartmouth did and become employees, but it is it is odd. It's only something that could happen in college sports today. All right, let's get out of the doom and gloom. we got to do score predictions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't even thought about my score prediction yet. So we got to do score predictions for, and again, these are not the final score predictions. We'll get published, dailynebraskan.com. Um, coming up in a couple of days... I guess I'll go first so Ben can consider his his score prediction. We had score predictions earlier in the week. Ben, Rose, and Emma, they gave theirs on our Monday show, so we're going to do ours today. I am going to go with, for my score prediction, 28-21 Nebraska winning. It would not surprise me if we saw lower scores on both sides. I do think this is going to be a low-scoring game. I don't trust Purdue's offense to save my life, but at the same time, Nebraska's defense is shaky right now, and while Purdue might be subjectively one of the worst teams in the conference, we also got to remember Division One athletes, they can still play. And I think that they're going to have their way with Nebraska's defense a little bit and put some points up. On the offensive side of the ball, as we mentioned, I think that the morning starts, first road game, all of these new things now coming into play for the offense is going to hinder them a little bit to start the game. They're going to get off to a slow start. They'll eventually pick it up and be able to get a touchdown late to take the lead and come out on top by the skin of their nose. It's line at this game set at about 9.5, 10.5 points on most sports books. I think Nebraska covers. I'm going to be a little hopeful with this one. I think the Nebraska running game will kind of control – the flow of the game. I think Nebraska will have the ball for a lot of time. I think they'll have long drives. I think with how bad Purdue's offense has been, I think they will be off the field a lot. I think they'll have a lot of three and outs, a lot few turnovers. I think Nebraska, they go up early and then kind of control from there. I'm going to say 31 to 10, Nebraska. Mm. I'm being a little hopeful. I think they kind of get back on track, especially coming going in to Rutgers. I got to be a little pessimistic though this week because I am last in the standings for score predictions by a pretty wide margin. I've had some pretty terrible predictions. I think I'm still in second. I think we all got the winner of last week's game wrong. Obviously. I think I'm still sitting in second. Yeah, that was not not a good week for us in score predictions. No. No. Can't wait for uh, us to have different winners eventually. Yeah, I that, w- that will be. That would be. I have a feeling it will be the Rutgers game. I think so too. I think definitely Indiana, we will see some conflict. Yes, yes, we will. 
this has been a fun show, Ben. Very I'm, fun. I'm glad, always fun. Glad you were able to, to come up and do this. This has always been a real fun thing to do. We got Scarlet Fever back off the ground, and it's doing really well, really well. And I'm glad everyone's been buying into it, yourself included. I haven't had Joseph on the show yet. We, your editor. we still got to get Joseph He's on busy here. Busy guy. Yeah, Joseph Meyer, our our senior sports editor. He's been real busy with with a lot of other stuff going on, but we're picking up where he left off, carrying the uh, the in show at the ticket last last semester. So we're having fun with this though, and it's going to be a fun week of Nebraska Nebraska sports. Busy weekend. Very busy. We got soccer coming up tomorrow. They'll be playing Illinois. Volleyball's playing. Friday and Sunday, football's on Saturday, a whole lot of Husker sports. For Ben Beecham, Danny Berg, thanks for hanging out. Thank you for listening. Scarlet Fever, we'll see you next time. Enjoy the games this weekend.